Coming up, the time is now for the Brooklyn Nets to trade veteran Dorian Finney-Smith. But is it as simple as calling around the league and finding out where the best suitors are? We dive in on the draft capital, the contract, and the best landing spots for DFS all coming up next. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ah, uh, yes, my friends, it is the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. He's Doug Nori. I'm Adam Armbrecht. We thank you, as always, for making us your first listen of the day. We are 100% free on all those great platforms. And let you know, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. And, Doug, where we get started is a little journey around Dorian Finney-Smith, the player that by no account should be judged by the Brooklyn Nets fan base, yet, as is so often the case in recent history, has kind of become the, the poster child for decisions that should have been made, things that should have been done. Now it seems like it's finally the offseason for this front office to move the FS. Yeah, look, uh, look, we can. This might be a referendum on where the net, like, sort of what the Nets should have done, what the Nets could be doing, and what maybe should have, like I said, should have already been done in the past, maybe even two seasons ago, and maybe definitely last season. But recent reporting is coming out that it looks like the Nets are going to possibly aggressively shop um, DFS this off season, maybe to try to get into the 2024 draft, which is looking a little bit on the weaker side, where that salary slash like his services might be better use to some of these teams sitting and we'll talk about what teams that could potentially be but mm -hmm. with the way this season is shaping up with dorian finney smith's contract and age the thought of trading him this offseason really does make all the sense in the world based on a, a variety of factors that we'll get into here but this reporting that the nets would be looking to probably try to move his contract here does make sense really from almost every possible angle <laughs> where the where the nets are concerned yeah i mean you you can do it on the contract level where he's at well, the full details with the player option coming and we we kind of over the last couple of seasons have talked about oh would he or wouldn't he pick that up it's hard to tell with money expanding around the nba there's probably still another decent contract for him potentially to earn on a championship level team but a lot of times, the guys like Dorian Finney-Smith go from being highly valuable and sought after to veteran minimum guys who end up on you know the back end of championship squads because they want to get that ring at the end of their career. Then there's the roster factor for the Brooklyn Nets, which we talked about going all the way back to last season's trade deadline. Well, now you have Noah Clowney in the mix, and he can play four or five. You know, has some flexibility there. We've talked about Jalen Wilson. He's a rotation player, but he certainly warranted more minutes as he moves forward in his young Nets career too. So now you have these players. Whereas I think at the start of last season, even though you and I believed he should have been traded already, Dorian Finney-Smith still represented a guy that was playing 25, 30 minutes a night. So it was hard to justify it, even if we thought they should. Now you have two players inside the organization that you believe can at least fill those minutes, let alone whatever else you do this offseason or through the draft. Yeah, and the Nets probably got themselves in a bad spot where DFS was concerned in that, you know, feeling like they, you know, these these two seasons now of kind of down the stretch trying to win, yeah. right? Yes. Like where they're just like, they are trying to make the playoffs. They're trying to save a little face off the hardened deal when it comes to conveying picks. They have no like, you know, structural incentive to lose. This is how you get in a spot where Dorian Finney Smith was not already traded. Oh, by the way, none of this is anti DFS. Like I think no. that he was a pretty important piece for what they did this year. And if everything shakes out correctly, you know, would have been a guy that they really probably could have relied on a little more, right? Like if Simmons plays the team's a little better, he was really good switch defender, he was one of their better rebounders, honestly, in a, a place where they were lacking at times. Like his size and versatility works for a lot of things that the Nets probably ended up wanting to do. Mm -hmm. It's a good news that this probably works for a lot of things other teams might want to do also, which is why he probably still retains some trade value. But going into the trade deadline last season, really, I do want, I mean, there, there for sure were calls made on him, yeah. right? And I wonder if the Nets and Sean Marks has done this in the past, 
has maybe stood up a little too much on, you know, his value compared to real value. Right. And maybe some of this stuff was already offered around DFS and it was turned down because it quote wasn't enough. And now we're just in a spot where you kind of got to trade them anyway. And I, I, it does feel like they've been, they've been a little late to the party with some of these moves that seemed so obvious from a writing on the wall perspective. And then they're just a little left holding the bag when it ends up when it's then it's like overwhelmingly obvious <laughs> that they just that they need to move on from the guy. Well, and that's the problem, too, with, you know, you mentioned a player like Derek Lively last episode talking about Dallas and they end up, you know, losing a few extra games, still get a really good player and a rookie that contributes when you look at the Brooklyn Nets. And no matter what, and the reason why I bring up Dallas is, well, that's a team that wanted to compete. They wanted to go on a deep playoff run. They're on a deep playoff run, yet they still found a way to develop a rookie player immediately and have him be a contributor. So that's why I, I think for you and I, you look at Dorian Finney-Smith and you go, right. If he was the reason why Noah Clowney, as raw as he may have been, wasn't developing sooner at the NBA level, that would feel like a little bit of a failing on the organizational side to say we're, we're roadblocking our developmental track, which we've seen them have problems with looking at Cam Thomas, obviously, in, in favor of a player who is a good player unto himself, but does not represent an impact in a wins and losses and the outlook of this current season to warrant the way that we're going about things. So obviously the Dorian Finney Smith contract with that player option, as we mentioned of 15.3, uh, 4 million, I should say uh, going into 2025 will be an interesting factor and probably a reason that some teams will take a speculative look at him. Where does the value lie though, especially with the week 2024 draft class coming up, we'll get into all of that and the teams that could be interested in just one moment. All right, before we get into that, I'll tell you about our friends over at FanDuel. Look, it's winner take all time in the NBA. FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a win of your own. Right now, new customers are going to get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150. You can bet on spreads, money lines, player props, so much more. You're going to visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. You're going to make every playoff shot, a shot count. Right. By the way, if you're going headed over to FanDuel right now, I don't mind Timberwolves plus two over the Mavericks. We're recording this Tuesday morning. If you're looking to get one of those $5 in there, uh, to get that $150 bonus. Timberwolves plus two, maybe a little shooting regression, maybe no Derek Lively for the Mavs, maybe all that kind of, it's just a little bit of motivation to not get swept. Minnesota plus two over at our friends. Don't Fandle. take the Pacers. Well, <laughs> visit Fandle.com slash locked on. You make every playoff. All right, so as we continue on the Locked On Nets episode, talking about Dorian Finney-Smith, where does his value lie and who are the teams that could be interested? I mentioned there, Doug, he has $14.3 million for the upcoming season of salary and then the player option for 15.4 effectively. Just quickly on that, we we've talked about that before. Do you, do you think that Dorian Finney-Smith is more or less likely to pick up his player option? And how much of a factor do we think that could play in potential teams saying, yeah, we'll give you maybe a first round pick. We're going to talk about value in the 2024 draft and beyond. But, you know, if we think you're going to pick up that option, we get two years of veteran Dorian Finney-Smith. That actually might weigh in here on teams that are willing to make a move for him. I think he could pick that up. He's it'd be his age 33 season, right? Like, I think his skill set will age okay, if not amazingly. I mean, getting a step slow on guarding, let's say, even like threes right? Like it would make it a little harder for him. He would need the shooting to kind of like be a little bit more like beginning of the season DFS and not end of the season DFS, right? Cause like the three point shooting finished at 35%, but tailed uh, as the season progressed. I think the age thing factors in pretty massively here. I think he probably does pick it up, but I'm not a capologist here. And I want to really stress that like there's a world where teams don't like that he wants to pick that up <laughs> yeah just like the mle is fine like i don't know like it, it's 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 a close call yeah, yeah. on that one um i think though what well, i don't think that would factor like too strongly into some of the if you're looking for him if you're looking to trade for him right now you are a team that like sees yourself you know moving like decently far in the playoffs would be my guess you want a versatile wing defender you want a guy who can switch you got want a guy who like in an absolute pinch can play the five Mm -hmm. right like a super small ball five he's done that a few times with the nets and it wasn't a total disaster and so if you have some other bigger bodies in the team and you're looking just to like upgrade the wing and hope that you run a little hot on the shooting mm -hmm. like yeah he's an attractive piece at 31 again i think a, a stronger draft we're probably not having this conversation 
but this might line up just well enough for the Nets with a weaker draft. Like a first in this draft might have been a second, depending on where, like middle of the first yeah. round, um, it would have been like a second round pick in the f- in, for a future draft or something like that. And so that's where I think the market will be. I do get a little worried, and there's nothing to be done about this now, but I do get a little worried that they, there, there's a world where they might have turned down something more a year ago. And, yeah. and I'll even give him, let him off the hook for like when he first came in over in the Dallas move, because maybe the timeline was just too constricted to turn it around when he came over right, with Dinwiddie right. and DFS. Now that, remember, that trade did happen like four days before the trade deadline. So there was some time. Like there's a world where that market could have been a little more, you know, percolating for him. And they had some time like that wasn't a right up to the deadline deal. Like I think they did that Sunday of trade deadline week, right? Like Kyrie got traded over the weekend leading into the trade deadline. So I don't know. I'll let him off the hook for that one because like whatever timing, but I get a little worried that what a la Royce O'Neal, when the trade ends up getting possibly sent to the league, we're like, huh, feels like that could have been more a year ago, but there's, it's sometimes hard to really know that. Yeah, and then there's the offseason. There's another trade deadline that passes for the Brooklyn Nets to make that kind of choice. Uh, that, that being the case, though, so there's two things in the factor in here in the short term. One, we're talking about the 2024 draft class. And on a high level, this is something that I've been trying to think about a lot. Or And I'll, 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 I'll make an assertion here. And I'll use the Brooklyn Nets Jalen Wilson draft pick in the second round as, 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 as a reason for fans to stop treating the 2024 draft class like a meaningless endeavor and it's pointless to get a first round pick. Because if you think it's a weak class, are you asserting that a player like Jalen Wilson taken in the middle second round, what would he be? Is he a top 15 pick in this year's draft class? Is that how weak you think it is? Top 20, top 25, first round pick maybe? Wherever you want to place him, the point is, is like he is a he is a bench role contributor on an NBA roster. And you are greatly diminishing the value of a 2024 first round draft pick if you think just because it's not going to be superstar level talent, there's not still quality contributing level talent. So I think that that's been a little bit of a disconnect here. And why, if you can get a team to give you a mid first round pick for Dorian Finney Smith, we'll give some examples and the issues within that. But this is why it should be still considered a quality outcome if you get a first round pick in this year's draft class for Dorian Finney Smith. Yeah, look, that's really like in a place where they just need all the younger players they can get. Like, I, right. I it, you know, weak draft, strong draft. Like, they are, they really can't afford to be too picky here. I know everyone wants to look and be like, well, they got all these picks coming up. Okay, well, great. They don't have them now. And they don't, it's not like they have crazy coffers of young talent on this team, right? right. Like, they have, you know, Bridges, Cam, these guys aren't young. It's fine. They're fine players, whatever. They're 28 and 27 years old. They're not young players. Schroeder's 25. Excuse me, Schroeder's 30. You know, Claxton's going into his age 26 season. Like, these guys are reaching sort of like the peak of their talent. And after that, it's like, you know, Cam Thomas. Okay, fine. Clowney, we're dream on him. 19 years old. I think the future is bright. People always throw Dariq Whitehead into this. The guy hasn't played an NBA minute, really. I mean, he did, but it doesn't really count. And he's got two injuries. So I, it's like, you can't really bank on this stuff. Jalen Wilson, the aforementioned Jalen Wilson, nice pickup. He's 23. He's not like super young, right? Sure, like he's sure. a four-year player. So overall, long story long is that it's just the Nets have to be in the mode of, yeah, I know you have these future assets. They have to try to get younger a little bit at each time if they can, because if even if they trade – all because the, they might trade all the draft picks later for another player, so it means they need to get younger now. And yes, if they end up yes. really need to get younger, like they, it all makes sense where they need to get younger any chance they can get. And if this represents that kind of opportunity, and go for it. And Sean Marks has shown that, like the ability to, to draft really well in these spots. So I like I have confidence there. Like he's drafted above slot many times already. And so you know, is there is it over? It's a crazy high peak value draft class. Probably not. But the Nets have shown the ability to find place to find get good, decent players sort of no matter what. A hundred percent. So, you know, and to your point, that's a really good reminder of no matter which direction the Nets are going, they need to keep getting young talent in here. No matter if you want to pursue stars sooner or later, trade picks away by 29, 20, 30. If you don't have your own picks or even if you're waiting on the Phoenix picks, you still need to have some plan in place here about how you're filling it in because you don't know how long any version of a high talent superstar driven team is going to be together. Every We're- team needs young players. Every right, team needs no young what. players like right. like you know, rebuilding, going for the championship, 
You need like we just, there's so many examples where you need to no matter where you are in the development path, you need young players who can play at some point. The salary cap is too restrictive, right? Like you just have to have guys on rookie deals, preferably a decent amount that can play. And when you don't, it gets really tough very quickly. Like yeah. we've seen this many times. Teams get priced out of their own success because they just don't have enough young guys that can play. I mean, to some degree, it happened to Denver this year. It's like the, the starting lineup was great. They didn't have a single other guy that could play. They couldn't sign Bruce Brown yeah. and they, they relied on young guys and it just, the guys didn't play. And so every team, no matter where you are, at some point, you need to be thinking about cycling in these rookie contracts with guys who can actually take real NBA minutes. Otherwise you get absolutely squeezed. And Again, like I, I, the Nets fans don't see it because the Nets fan Nets haven't drafted in like absolutely forever, and so no one can even like picture what it's like to draft players and develop them because it's just like legit never happens. But it just has to happen. Like at some point, you can't just keep kicking the can down the road. You know what's funny too? Because you mentioned there not having their own, not having a lot of picks or high or even mid round first round picks. But it's funny because then when you look at the roster to these different levels, Cam Thomas, Nicholas Claxton, Noah Clowney. Uh, you also throw in the big man that I'll forget his name because that's Dayron Sharp. I think he is. Thank you, Dayron Sharp. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm with it. It's in the middle of summer. It's fine. But like you know, and then Jalen Wilson as well. When you actually look at it, like no, they haven't had a lot of opportunities to do it. But even and and I think the reason why it gets diluted a little bit is because it's not like the team has been successful as a whole, right? It's not like they've been playing some winning basketball. You haven't seen even you know to any any degree here guys that have contributed in sub, in substantial ways. Claxton is now a big factor, right? So even though you draft him and you develop him, but now you're at the precipice of are you supposed to pay him or not as he goes to free agency? Cam Thomas, you finally get out of your own way a little bit on him, but what's going to be his future? And the team hasn't been winning at a high level. To say nothing of Dayron Sharp and whether or not we think he's really a part of the long term future. Jalen Wilson contributed all this stuff. So technically, fans should look at the roster and go, oh look. Even with minimal assets, they've been able to get in some quality players. The pushback on that would be right, but the team hasn't been particularly good. So that's why you're seeing more of these guys than if they were on other rosters around the NBA. And certainly playoff teams or high caliber championship competing teams, it might look a little bit different. That being the case, here comes the biggest factor. Great. The Brooklyn Nets are ready to trade Dorian Finney-Smith, and maybe they're willing to lower what that asking price looks like. Whether it is in the 2024 draft or beyond, who are the teams that you would target and it would make sense to want to add Dorian Finney-Smith, but may have some restrictions of their own standing in their way? We'll get into that to close out today's episode, all coming up next. All right, so as we tie a bow on today's Locked on Nets episode, talking about Dorian Finney-Smith and where the trade value is, we all understand that, yes, probably on a pass-through trade when he came over from Dallas initially would have been the better time. Maybe last offseason, maybe this past trade deadline, but we're here now and there's an opportunity for the Brooklyn Nets to improve this roster. Let's start in the 2024 draft before I, I pose a question about a future draft beyond this year. If you think about teams and I'll use the Miami Heat as the example because they're a veteran team, though they likely will want to keep it together and he's the kind of guy that fits the timeline, their short term timeline right now. The biggest factor for Miami Heat or a lot of teams that we may talk about wanting Dorian Finney Smith is money. If you stand there and say, Dorian Finney-Smith for your 15th overall pick in the NBA draft, fantastic. Now all you have to do is send $15 million out. And at that point, when you start to look over Miami's roster, you'd say, well, would the Miami Heat really think that a player in salary match plus a first-round pick, even in a weak class, is worth Dorian Finney-Smith? So this is like the micro example. There are plenty of teams that have real cap restraints around being able to take in Dorian Finney-Smith even at a modest 14 and change million dollar contract while also giving the Nets some value specifically in 2024. Yeah, this is going to this is actually probably the biggest problem is that like now like most times like luckily DFS makes a little like so little that there can be like a salary cap cobble together, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of just like a, a few smaller contracts to kind of get there. The, the unfortunate part here is that a lot of the teams that probably would be interested in the services, i.e. teams that like are probably trying to win now are already over the cap teams. Sure. And when that is, and that becomes like, you know, the teams that are under the cap, which there aren't many, but the teams that have money to spend aren't going to be looking to grab this guy because they just kind of don't need his services. So the teams like the heat, right. I'm not the Sixers so much Pels, the Pels maybe don't need wings. Like we'll go through the list of guys here, right. Lakers have, have been thrown in there. Thunder have been thrown in there like calves. Um, there's teams out there that 
would want him, but like, are they going to have enough salary matching? It's probably not going to be like players that the Nets are too excited about. Maybe they're just right. trying to get move off a contract here or there in order to get it, but it's not going to be as easy as just sending him out and getting a pick back like that. That is for sure. And so it might get a little hairy around that. And I actually do wonder if we, it, it, there's a, there's a part where it bogs down because of that to some degree, but sure. luckily his number isn't crazy high that, there are scenarios with just sort of these end of the bench salary fodder flop, some kind of guys that they can probably cobble something together, but it's not, I can see it not being like super, super smooth. No. And as, as you mentioned, teams that are not competitive right now, don't really care about adding a veteran, you know, three and D wing like Dorian Finney Smith. Interestingly enough, I'll throw out one. If we want to go on the other side of it, factoring in the idea of salary restraints, you know, depending on how far Dallas goes, and this is kind of whether or not they win or don't win the championship, but it's been a great season for Dallas. Dorian Finney-Smith is from Dallas. Go ask Nick Angst that. Everyone in Dallas wants Dorian Finney-Smith back. They don't, they don't care whatever it takes. And right now, an interesting version of this. So like with Miami, you'd say, Miami has, so if you look at them, you go, okay, salary, uh, Duncan Robinson. Well, there's some, Duncan Robinson has some value to him, you know, as a player. So then you say, is it really worth the 15th overall pick in 2024 plus Duncan Robinson? Probably not. And you can try to think about cobbling other things together. Fine. Look at Dallas though. In Dallas's case, a team that probably would be happy to move on from a player like Tim Hardaway Jr. who makes 16 million. Now you're getting into these waters for the nets where you're going, Hey, We'll give you the player you want in Dorian Finney-Smith. We'll take an expiring contract. So we're still on the same agenda. Let's get through 2024. Ben Simmons coming off. Also, Tim Hardaway Jr. coming off the books. And, hey, it's going to be the 30, you know, the, the 29th or 30th pick in the 2024 draft. So if you're Dallas, you say that's pseudo a second round pick. If you're the Nets, you think you still can get a quality player and set up for more money coming off the books for the 2025 off season. Like that might be a very palatable version for all sides. And, and that's a rare occasion here when you look around these teams. Yeah. And that, that end up, might end up be where they're, they kind of end up landing. Right. Like, and I think as we get further into this, we'll, you know, with this reporting just coming out, like, I think we'll have ways that we can really dissect this and like, see, you know, probably a little more finely tuned on, you know, what exact players could come over here. The Hardaway one is an interesting one. I mean, obviously, basically out of the rotation here for the Mavericks in the playoffs, like doesn't seem like he's part of like what they want to do in the short term and almost for sure not in the long term. <laughs> by, the so, way, by the way, yeah. I'll, I'll roll this conversation forward about um, getting, maybe potentially getting not 2024, but looking to 2025 or 2026. And no better example of that than the Dallas Mavericks because they don't have a 2024 first round pick. So, because the Nets have that. Now, listen, listen, when we talk about their second round pick that they have from Boston or getting into 25 or 26. It's actually a part of where I wanted to get to this too, is if it's not, if it's a teams that are, so say Memphis, now they're picking top 10, even in a weak draft class, that's too rich to be sending out for Dorian Finney Smith. Even if they are still interested in a move like that, then I think you start to think about would the Brooklyn Nets take a long view and say 2025 would be happy to, I think you'd be hard pressed to find teams that are willing to in that kind of deep class, but even 26 or even 27, if a team wants to offer a future first for value in Dorian Finney Smith. Now, I think that that opens up a much wider audience for certain teams, as long as you can make the, the money work and saying, yeah, listen, we think we're going to be competitive over the next two and three seasons, a team on the come up, maybe that you could look and say the nets. Yeah. man, that being a mid to late round first pick, but it gets the best value and at least puts us in a position on potentially deeper draft classes down the road. Yeah. And just real quick, like clarifying the net, the nets don't have the Mavs pick this year. No, your original, the original thesis was correct. was correct. Um, like around <laughs> yes, right. right. future, future first Dallas down dr round draft pick, but Dallas does not have their own first round pick this year. There's too correct. much, there's too much assets flying around. these. Yeah. Days. Well, this is the problem. All these trips, the, <laughs> I will say following this stuff, like, you going through the decision and if, if, if tree around some picks, there's so many picks have been traded in recent years and there's so many pick swaps out there that you can lose yourself in this really fast around. Oh, I mean, yeah. just I, honestly go look at like the nets. They're not going to do it, but like the nets trading back for the rockets pick. And then there's an OKC swap in there too. And it's like, you get swapped. It feels like it gets swapped to infinity and you're just like, <laughs> right. Oh, did the Nets just end up with all three? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, <I> see, like, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, picking six times in the 2024 NBA draft. It, that's the, it is another problem with this, right? When you are trying to dissect these like potential trades besides just the money 
trying to figure out who has their own picks, which ones are actually going out. Again, like there's been so many massive trades around the, especially around these teams that are actually good now that still are conveying picks to other places. Like that might be like bucks with the holiday trade bucks with the Lillard trade. The Lakers with an AD trade, oh, the yeah. the uh, like the Dallas with all their trades, like I, all these teams have made and just such crazy amount of trades over the last few years, and a lot, some of these like especially the picks have gotten kicked the can down the road on them because they don't convey because of, mm-hmm. of protections. It is a total mess. Anyway, point being, uh, there's a world where I think like teams would be less incentivized to do it for like a 25 pick unless they thought they'd be really good. I think we've already seen some of these teams facing the sort of like the same existential threat that the Nets face, which is like, we can't throw away the whole future here because right. we have to get cheaper at some point also. <laughs> and uh, we we're going to need to pick. So I think there would be less incentivized to do it. I think some of these teams have gotten a massive favor done to them where all the talk around this draft pa- class is about how bad it is. And I think even like fan bases wouldn't be, wouldn't overthrow anyone to like, know that a first went this year because like, I don't know, they've just been told time and time again about, you know, how bad it is. <laughs> and it seems right. like that's just the, the walking thing. But like if the Nets end up in the second round, which I think is, I don't know, not likely, but possible with DFS, I think that's just, that might just be what it is. I mean, if God, if they could get up to like Isaiah Collier, like in the middle of the first or something like that and get a point guard, another point guard on the roster through the yeah. draft, that might be a place that we'd be really, <laughs> really excited to talk about. Because I think like that would be somewhere they'd probably need to really target, like point guard play, no matter what kind of happens here with the team. Maybe that's a talk for a later toward the draft, but <laughs> like this is where you start as a Nets fan. You're like, hey man, let's get in here and like get a guy, a little older, but a little more polished, something like yeah. that, that can actually come in and take some ball handling duties. Like, could we talk ourselves into something like that? Like, this is where I kind of do get a little jazzed about them moving on from DFS. No, and that's the idea of you mentioned like a guy like Carlton Carrington at the back end of the first round. You look at A.J. Mitchell, who's in a second round, which is a good caveat to close out on just that, hey, we're talking about first round picks, but maybe it's still about multiple second round picks. And maybe you just get more of those from teams along with the salary match because it's going to take something to to make this work. And it's going to be what Sean Marks and the Brooklyn Nets have to decide about. And I mentioned earlier about uh, the Miami Heat, a guy all the way up like Jared McCain, if you want to get into the mid first round, potentially. But in all these situations, Sean Marks is going to be balancing the books about, sure, do I want a first-round pick? Of course I do. But if I have to match salary, and then I just have second-round picks to play with for the next two or three seasons as well, it ha- there's going to be an equation here. And the hope is that the Brooklyn Nets in their front office do not get beholden to what we've seen them before, creating a narrative for themselves and not being able to move off of that narrative, right? It looks like they're moving in the right direction. It looks like Josiah is starting to signal things at a high level about what this team is going to do. Seeing a Dorian Finney-Smith trade before the draft you know, later in June would be the first sign indicator. Okay, they're not just talking about changing directions or making some proactive choices. Now they're actually starting to do them. And until we see that, it's going to be this version of it where we give you all the reasons why they need to while still not being sure if they will. Yeah, we've done this many times with the Nets. Uh, This has been sort of a recurring theme and hopefully will not continue to be recurring, but that's just the way it is. We're going to get out of here. Much appreciated to everyone who's still rocking with us through the, I mean, based on the numbers on YouTube, especially, I mean, lots of people into the off season talk, much appreciated. Again, as we've always said, Nets did not hold up their end of the playoff bargain, but it's okay. We're going to rock with you all the way through the playoffs into the draft. And beyond, make sure you subscribe to Locked On Nets on YouTube. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. A lot of people understand what not saying anything means. So, in effect, not saying anything is really saying a lot. That is one Bill Walton. Oh, RIP to a true legend and one of the all-time great poets. We'll be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball. Basketball, basketball, basketball.